Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me, let me begin this by saying that some great things are going to happen today. Great things are going to happen because great things have already happened. Uh, I will not have anything to do with it. It won't be my doing at all. Not at all at all, and this, I guess, might be where we should begin. I want to thank all of you for being there last night. I would tell you that it's difficult to stand up and talk to a general group and to people who really know nothing of or know very little of the world as spirit, as mind, as consciousness, as opposed to what appears to be just a physical world, a material world. It's difficult to talk to people who are unacquainted with metaphysics or truth or whatever other term you want to use. It's much easier to talk to a group where there is a sense of rapport. And the establishment of rapport seems to be necessary in this thing called communication. But those of you who have studied metaphysics for many years and have become very absolute, quote, absolute in your thinking, would quarrel with the use of the word communication because you would say this means tunis. It means that it is the transference of thoughts and ideas from one to another. And so you would say, well, now this is dualism and I, this isn't what I've come here to hear. Uh, in any event, those of you who are here this morning, this is the one in a thousand, two in ten thousand. Those that are here this morning are genuinely, earnestly interested. Or you wouldn't be. You've, you've made a pilgrimage, so to speak. You've traveled a distance and you've come. And it's been at a personal sacrifice. Some of you have traveled a lot of miles. And some of you here in this room have traveled thousands of miles. And uh, I, just let me tell you, you can't do what you've done this morning. You can't do it. You can't listen to what I have to say this morning after having made the sacrifice that you've made without something coming forth as a consequence of it. And something will happen. It will happen. Now let me tell you so that you can be aware of it, what will happen. And just generally speaking, somewhere along the line during the course of this, these talks, that I will keep as simple as I can and as non-absolute as I can, but as honest as I can. Somewhere along the line, there will be a feeling of relief, a feeling of relief. Now, this brings us up to this thing about what is illumination anyway? What is this thing of illumination? Everybody, so many of the philosophies in the world say that until you've had this grand, blinding, spiritual birth within that you haven't lived, that until such time as you see all the trees on fire or see the waves like a breathing ocean or until you see the grass aflame or something that you haven't lived, Many of the metaphysical philosophies that are propounded in the world say that, that illumination is the aim, the object of it all. Well, I won't quarrel with that, but I would say that I did for a very long time myself go about looking for some kind of a big blinding road to Damascus experience in which everything was transformed and suddenly I would be on a mountaintop and never be conscious again of physicality or materiality and have no more trials or tribulations and that everything would be sweetness and light from that point on and this is what I looked for and I went to India and studied with one man who was intended to do just that. His, his 
forte was was the, the experience of illumination. And that was what I was to see and have and feel. And uh, I didn't have any such experience with him that I recognized at the time. Yet I really had it, but didn't know it. Now, it was because I didn't know it, I mean, that, that had it and didn't know it, that I want to make mention of what you might expect and look for this morning and accept it for what it is. I would ask you to remember that, that all of the religions of the world, somewhere along the line, have always made the statement that if you can't be trusted with pennies, you'll never be expected to have dollars. In one way or the other, it makes that statement. Jesus put it in monetary terms. He says, if you can't, if you can't be trusted with pennies, then how do you ever expect to have dollars? Well, this thing of illumination is, uh, is a much more ordinary and common and everyday experience than we have ever recognized and realized. The thing of illumination, that is real spiritual insight, is something that happens every day, every day for every one of us, but goes unrecognized and unheralded and unappreciated. And it seems to have to be appreciated, recognized and then appreciated for what it is, for the little thing that it is. First. So now let me just come down to a story about one called Bill here. Now Bill, bear in mind, doesn't know anything that you don't know. Bill is just an image in a way. This thing called, this is so unimportant, the body form has nothing whatever to do with it. What is important, if you remember from what we said last night, what is important is the, the listening that, that you are, the awareness that you are. Awareness is where the value lies, which is what life is. And not what you see within it. Now what you see within it is present for a reason. It tells you things. Jesus made the remark, know what is before your eyes, then that which is hidden from me will be revealed. So you can know what you're seeing, an aspect of yourself, right here, right now, talking to yourself. Just as surely as if you were just sitting and thinking and pondering. The same thing is going on now, except it is what you would say outside, rather than you thinking within. You're thinking right now, except that it's outside. Now, the outside is the inside. The thing that we call the body form is just a point in time and space where it appears that the outside becomes the inside. It's also the point at which the inside becomes the outside. Now, that's not hard to understand. That's very simple. Let's say that again. Right now, you hear a sound that appears to be coming from a, out there, you would say, meaning out there from a physical body. All right, now, you hear the sound, and then, then you begin to think about it. And where is that point in time and space that, that you begin to think about? It? It's what you call a body form. So, so the body form then represents the point at which the sound on the outside becomes the thought on the inside. It's also the point where the thought on the inside, if you should articulate it and speak, becomes the sound on the outside. And one time Jesus was asked, when shall we see the kingdom of heaven? When are we going to see it? He had already told them a hundred times, I'm sure, a thousand times, that you're walking around in it for Pete's sake. You're knee deep in it. You're looking at it. But they say, when will we see it? He said, when you make the outside as the inside. The inside as the outside. So right now, right now, you're listening to an aspect of yourself that appears outside. It seems that it's outside of a physical body, a point in time and space, but it isn't really. And why isn't it really outside? And why is the outside and the inside the same? Because now you're not identifying any longer as a point in time and space, as we pointed out last night. But you have lifted your gaze from the shadows 
to that which is the basis in being for shadow. If you have lifted your gaze from the shadow of the tree to the tree itself, that is, from the belief of an identity limited in time and space, to awareness, consciousness, life, which is self-evidently right here, right now, all there is. All you've ever been is this life that is living presently, right here, right now, within which every sight that you've ever seen has been seen and every sound you've ever heard has been heard. So the outside and the inside right now are all one and the same and you're listening to yourself, an aspect of yourself. Now, it's true, we can give labels and names to these aspects of ourselves. We still call them Mary and Bill and John and Jack, husband and wife, family, government, institutions, but now for once, and perhaps the first time, you're seeing that that these labels are just labels that you've given some phase or aspect of the very self you are. Now, awareness is alone and by itself. And it's unchallenged. And it has no competition. And it isn't struggling. It isn't fighting and it isn't contending, really. Of course, it doesn't seem that way, does it? It seems that, gee whiz, we've got a marriage institution or a financial institution that would place great, great weight on us and would tell us what to do and what not to do. It would seem that we have a body organization that would say, you're stiff and, and tired and, and growing old, or that it's unfulfilled and lonesome, filled with frustrations of one sort or another. This is how it seems. Now today, during the course of this day, we'll resolve some of those things so that we can understand them. We'll be doing what we have long been admonished to do and have long known we should do, to understand what is before our eyes. And then that which is hidden will be revealed. Jesus made a very beautiful remark. He said, I am not come of myself, but him who has sent me is what this little verse is I have not come of myself but him who has sent me is true we can each make such a statement for ourselves this awareness has not come of itself this awareness that life is but that which is being this awareness is absolutely true and faithful When we awaken in the morning, we don't have to do anything to be aware. We don't have to stick a plug in the wall. We don't have to wind up anything. We don't have to pull a lever or throw a switch. Awareness is aware, effortlessly aware, continually aware. And the psychologist will tell you that even when you're sleeping, that awareness is quite aware. Even if you're unconscious, awareness is quite aware. Awareness goes on about its business of being aware all the time without ceasing. And uh, by the way, what is this awareness anyway? Just what is it? What is awareness? Good morning. Please come in and join. Nice to have you. And you haven't missed anything. What is this? Now, what we're doing is we're just laying the groundwork for what we're going to say later. What is this awareness that's aware right here, right now? What is it? Yes, awareness. Consciousness. I use them all as synonymously, and as you've read at least the recent things, that 
that I've written, I've used them synonymously, but awareness, yes, and consciousness be the same. But what really is awareness? Life. Life and awareness are surely synonymous terms. Life. When one says, I am aware, he's in essence saying, I am alive. But what is awareness? What is it? Let's be specific. Let's know what is before our eyes, as it was put, and then that which is hidden will be revealed. What is awareness? A state of being. <laughs> Great. Yes, it's a state of being, but can we be more specific? Let's really get it right down to a razor's edge because that's what we want. We all want to know an answer that is so tangible that it becomes applicable literally applicable in a people, places, and things arena. We want to come down out of the clouds so that we can see the supply that we know is ever present. So that we can be the health that we know we are. So that we can feel the joy that we know is identity. That's how literal we want to be, how practical we want to be. So how Let's take this thing, awareness, and really make it razor sharp. Can, can, we, can we make it more explicit? All that we are. Yes, again, it's all. This awareness is absolutely all. You're darn right. Yes, we've never seen anything except within and as. This awareness is away. Right here, right now. And we've never felt a thing except as this awareness that's aware right here, right now. All of the so-called senses, all mentation is taken place within and as this awareness that's aware right here, right now. And we've never been anything but it. But can we get even more specific than that? Let's make a break to, yes, Hilda. No. It is self-recognition. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Yes. It's being. Yes. But have we said anything yet that's going to allow us to really cut the mustard in what we call a people, places, and things arena? Yes, sir. I think it would be knowing. Now, knowing. Great. Knowing. Well, now, let me ask a question so we can expand it. Who and what is doing the knowing? Self. And would you care to try to identify self or give it a title or a label or a name so that we can maybe even be more specific? Me? How would you spell that me? With a big old capital M or a little capital M? Capital I. Capital I, meaning identity. All right, well, now let me, let me just say what, so that those who read will, what little I've written, and perhaps it will help it make sense, and I'm sure it will help as you read anybody's work in the metaphysical arena, in the arena of so-called those so people who go out and talk <laughs> about truth, whoever they might be. Awareness is the functioning of mind. Mind. Now, mind functions. That is, mind would not be mind if mind were not aware. There would be no such thing as an unaware mind, a mind that was not aware, not conscious. So, to really be very literal here, in a most non-absolute way, we would can say very quickly that awareness, this thing called life, all of this that's going on, all of this mentation is the functioning of mind of mind. Now, for myself, I would spell that mind with a capital M, and I would call it, if I had to call it anything at all, 
if I were forced to label it at all, I would say that that mind is God. God. Mind. Now this is not new, of course, because I think every philosophy in the world, major religion in the world, with one exception, makes mind and God the same, that is, the synonymous term. If, it has, if, if one has to put a title on what cannot really be titled or labeled, called God, you know, the Jews of old never would utter the word aloud for God. They just leave it blank in their writing. When they come to the word God, they say, well, now, the minute I label it, it's going to be a finite label, and that, therefore, cannot be God. Or be this ineffable one, and so, so why even put a label on it? The minute you label it, the minute you give it a title, the minute you call it by anything, because the minute you begin to conceptualize it, you have finitized it and made it finite, and therefore it's no longer infinite. And so why even write anything? And if you remember the old Taoist sage, he said, "If I, I must." call it anything. If I have to, I call it Tao, and I hail it as supreme. So we'll say now that for the sake of our talk to proceed from here, that mind is God. God and mind are all one God. Now mind is not inert and without purpose or reason or its mind is living alive mind is about the business of being away knowing mind is being self-conscious it is cognizing itself well now it is necessary as we proceed here in order, we're just covering basics, just simple basic metaphysics. And it's amazing, you know, as one goes about to see how people who study metaphysics all, all their lives don't have the, just the rudimentals of metaphysics straight. This is like, like you're mathematicians and you've progressed way, way, way up, but you haven't gotten the rudimentals, the fundamentals of arithmetic straight. And so here we're, we're just going to touch down on the fundamentals of metaphysics. And most certainly, most certainly, the basic predicate of the term metaphysics, and this is a Western term, metaphysics, is that God, or mind, is all. That there is nothing but mind, or God. That God is all in all. God is all as all. Well, now, the young people will immediately say, well, prove it. Prove it. What do you mean God is all? That's just a bunch of words. How do you know? Make this literally, tangibly, practically applicable. Show me how God is all. Well, in essence, we did that last night. We pointed out last night that, after all, what has, what's the only thing you've ever been aware of? Was it not awareness? Was it not? Have you ever been outside this awareness that's aware right here, right now? Has there ever been any sensation? Has there ever been any cognition? Has there ever been any hearing, seeing, feeling, or anything? It was not this awareness with which you live forever alone, as which you live forever alone. Alone really meaning all one, not by yourself not in loneliness, but all one. And if you can see, and this takes, a, this is a, only, a, it takes only an intellectual acceptance to perceive this point, just all of a sudden you say, gee whiz, really, really, all one awareness. It's always been just all one awareness. Everyone I've ever seen and felt and heard has been this awareness I am, an aspect of myself. I have forever been looking at myself, hearing myself, 
usually looking out and criticizing and condemning the biggest part of myself, liking much of myself and despising much of myself, loving certain aspects of myself and trying to get rid of other unloving aspects of myself, or to change it, or to crusade against it, or to kill it, or heal it. And so we've had an all one, part of which we called real, and part of which we call bad, or unreal, or illusion, or something to be transcended. And all the while, we've had one awareness, we've lived alone as one awareness. Consequently, we have proof right here, right now, tangibly and literally, of one all-inclusive, ineffable isness, or God, or mind, for which this very awareness, that right here, right now, is aware, is the functioning. Okay, now everybody relax just a minute. Just, just relax. Take a deep breath, will you? If you were in Mountain Brook right now, we'd get up and go out and sit underneath the apple trees or something. We'd go out and we'd listen to the birds. And we would go outside and we would listen just a minute and we would hear bird sounds. And you'd smell the fragrance of pine, and right now there's ripe persimmon on my persimmon tree, and the trees are full of mockingbirds as they, as they scuffle for those persimmons. And right now, out at Lobos, your stage is green, and it's becoming very aromatic. All of this is included within this awareness that is aware right here, right now, and it is all an aspect of yourself. And it's the only awareness that you've ever been aware of, the only one you've ever been concerned with, and everything in it has been but an aspect of yourself. And suddenly you see that the dominion is present as yourself. May I use the, the analogy again? Now, there, it does seem that people who teach along these lines teach. There's nobody teaching. There's nobody about the business of learning. It's only a matter of self-discovery and self-cognition going on. But it does appear that we hear the same stories over and over and over. I know what this young lady is doing. Don't you people think she's sleeping? She's not sleeping on me. Awareness is everywhere. Incidentally, science has just pointed out that that little twilight zone between wakefulness and sleep is the time when we're really most alert. And it's when we are hyper-aware and all of that that we've got the intellect to contend with. And this is why very often when a presentation is being made, that there appears to be sort of a hypnotic or sleep-inducing thing, and you fight like mad, but this is when you're really hearing a drowsiness. And so don't think for a minute that you're not comprehending in those minutes. So quit fighting that battle. You don't even have to fight the battle to stay alert. Never, never. The art of communication has pointed out a lot of these silly little things that, that, that education doesn't seem to know about. That a lecture like this or a talk like this is the poorest way to communicate, really. The real communication that will transpire this morning proceeds will be a heart-to-heart -heart communication and will have absolutely nothing to do with the world. It will be a jolt or a tingle or a gentle feeling of relief and release that you feel within. And this is the experience of illumination. It makes you feel like you're naked. It makes you feel like you have finally let go 
finally let go some of the weight of the world, some of the fear, some of the frustration, and you feel suddenly like you're relieved. Now, it's not a feeling of exaltation, aside from the fact that you say thank you for the, rel- for the agony that's gone, that doesn't appear to be part of this experience. But it, but it is not a grand elation at first. Once upon a time in my life, after having looked many years for this experience of illumination and never finding it, and after taking many metaphysical books and flinging them out the window and ripping the covers off of them and arguing with many teachers because I could not find what I was looking for and I had set something, I had set my cap to find illumination. I said that this was a holy quest and that that no desire could be more beautiful and perfect than to find this great grand light of life that everyone was talking about, but I couldn't see nor feel nor understand, except intellectually. I was in a basement of a building, but I was more than in a basement of a building. I can tell you I was in the basement of the stage, and all of you know what that means. We all know what that means. The feeling of anguish and agony and despair and hopelessness and helplessness where and I was sitting at a desk in a basement and I could see out of a little window up high in the room that allowed you to see out on a sidewalk on the street and there was a metal fence that went along there. Many of you have heard me say this, but just listen again. And hear it again, and pretty soon you'll hear it all the way to the heart. I was sitting there filled with anguish, and all of a sudden I said out loud, incidentally I was writing the melody at this time, of what later became the melody, the woodcutter and the king. Had a big stack of bills on the desk and no way to pay them. I had financial obligations, family obligations, I had kids to put through school. It did appear that there was nothing in the world that would allow me to meet all of those obligations, and I was feeling very woeful, very much filled with agony that morning or that afternoon. And it had been that way all day. And I'd done everything that I knew to do to get out and snap out of it. And all to no avail. Oh, I had picked up the books that I that had been in the past the most enlightening and illuminating, and I'd gone to them, but they were just words. And I had, I was reading a lady and studying with one lady that had been a great light in my life, and I had just a few days before been told by her not to come and visit her. No, 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 she said. And this was a heartbreaking thing, because I was one of these teacher-to-teacher people, willing to go anywhere if I thought I could find this light that I was looking for. And so here I am in the basement of despair, and finally I said out loud, Father, now now when I say Father, who am I talking about? Uh, Awareness, talking about the mind it is. I'm not talking about a tunis, and this is not old theology you hear. When I say Father, I have reference to the mind I am, the mind being this awareness. I can't separate mind from awareness. So don't fall away just because I do in child likeness say Father, thank you, Father. Nothing wrong with that, as far as I'm concerned as long as you know what you're saying. So I said, Father, it's peace I long for. Peace I long for. Perfection I long to see. That's what I said. I said it out loud. I wrote it on a piece of paper. And then I said it out loud, and then I remember in almost anguish and agony, I banged the table. Peace I long for. All of a sudden, it was just peace. I was willing to settle for peace. I was willing to give up this quest for the great grand life 
that was supposed to transcend everything and let me see the trees on fire, as I had heard about, or to see another dimension, as I had heard about, or to transcend all materiality, as I had heard about. But I finally just said, the peace I want. If I could just come out from out from under the awful anger, just for a minute, that's what I, I was willing to settle for that. All of a sudden I quit looking for the dollar and I would settle for that penny of peace. Well, right at this time a little boy walked up the street. I guess he was coming home from school. And he had a pencil or a ruler or something and he was banging along the fence. Click, 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 click as he walked up the street. I had just said, it's peace I wanted to see. Then I looked out and I saw a bright, shining face. No anguish, no frustration, no fear, no worry about dollars or bills to pay. Anticipating a happy afternoon of playing and getting into mischief or something. Probably figuring out ways to not do his homework. But happy. Yes, he clicked up the street. And for the first time it dawned on me that I had asked for something too I longed to see when all of a sudden it occurred to me that there it was. I am seeing peace. There it was. I was seeing it. I said, well, he isn't worrying. There's no frustration there. At least there's no frustration. And after all, that is included within this awareness, so I've got at least a little speck within this awareness that is peaceful. Now, if I were identifying as that little body sitting in the chair, there was still agony in that little body sitting in the chair, but at least if I identify as awareness, I am looking out at the whole scene and included in the whole scene was a little boy, another little speck, but there was a little bit of peace as it walked up the street banging away on the fence. No fears, no frustration, no agony. And I recognized it, and I said, Thank you, Father because I felt like, like anguish and agony pouring out of my fingers. Now, there are some of you here in the room right now feeling that because I feel it. Just letting go, letting go of an anguish and an agony that doesn't have any right to hang on. It has no authority nor power to hang on, and so it naturally falls away when we quit clutching it to ourselves and making a big to-do of it and saying it's something to be struggled against or fought against or it'll fall away of its own accord. Just as surely as the shadow disappears in sunset or just as surely as the shadow is all gathered together into a single little lump, right, that is hardly noticeable at high noon. Well, for a minute, the anguish poured right out of my fingers. And I said, thank you, Father. But now listen, all of you, here's something that can be very practical in your faith. I took this big, deep breath, and it was like the air was light. It was like you feel after you've had a good, long game of tennis. The way that feeling of the air is very light and fresh. And you feel at peace with yourself. It's like you've just had a, a bath, or like you've been baptized. And incidentally, this is the meaning of the baptism. This is what it comes from. It's this very experience. It feels like you've been bathed with water. All of you want to know where this, what the symbolism and symbology of the baptism is? This is what it is, and this is what is meant. And those who have really had the experience know precisely what I mean as though you were bathed from head to foot with warm water. But what it is, it's a pouring away of frustrations and anxieties, and it's a sense of peace, just for a minute. It's the sense of the absence of the former agony. That's all. And it comes as a great change, because, because you've been suffering, the agony is real, but suddenly the agony is gone, and, and it's really a void. 
feeling a void, it's an emptiness. But you're so happy for the emptiness that finally you'll say thank you for it, you know. Okay. I, that's what I did. I said, thank you, Father. And then, but with the old human predilection, what we all do, I then said, okay, now I feel great. I'll tackle these bills now that I can do it. And so I reached over and I grabbed them all. And now this was the thing that as appearances go, this was the thing that had caused the heaviness in the first place, you see. <laughs> And I stopped. All of a sudden, I said, now hang on just a minute. Let's savor this moment of peace. Let's savor it. Let's don't forget it. Let's linger this time for a change. Let's, why should I dive headlong back into the manure? <laughs> so I did for a minute sit there. And by this time, the little boy was gone. But I began to see it again. And I saw it again. And this time I began to call to mind the qualities and attributes of the, the sight and the sound that I had seen. Not the physical sight. I would say, well, there was confidence, there was joy, there was youthfulness. And I took it out of the, the so-called material and put it into the qualities and, and attributes that that scene represented. And, and lo and behold, the, this peace, this absence of anger, which is what illumination is. Hear that again. The absence of anger, the absence of worldliness, the absence of the belief and dream of materialism is what illumination really is. Not the grand presentation of some kind of a big blinding thing. The people that talk about this big blinding thing are only the ones that, that have had the most to drain away. And it seems by, by contradistinction, to use that word, or by delineation, it appears to be a big, tremendous thing, but it was the absence. And it lingered, it stayed with me for, for most, most of the afternoon. All right, but it, but late in the evening, as it came time to go home, all of a sudden, here comes that old spirit of heaviness back again. And I, intellectualism was back again, and I looked at those bills, and I said, well, okay. And in this tangible arena, I've still got those bills to pay. In the tangible world scene, I still have the trials and tribulations. I still have the wife that's going to be unhappy if I'm not home in time for dinner. And I still have this schedule to meet. I still have to answer the telephone. I still have to eat. I still have to wash my face and hands and brush my teeth and comb my hair and go through all of the mundane things called the bodily chores, and that seems to be the... And I'm still stuck with all of that until the old spirit of heaviness seemed to come back. But I got up. I got up, and I said, No, no, hang on, Bill. And having... As many of you know, this predilection for going out and walking and looking, I got up and I walked out and I started walking up the street. At this time, in my so-called metaphysical studies or metaphysical awakening, I was at that point where it had, I was told to overcome desire, to have nothing to do with desires anymore. Now, that's where I was, if you want to know where along a so-called pathway I appeared to be. And so at this time, I was not ever looking at anything that would make me want to get something. <laughs> not so long ago, a lady came to visit me, and she says, she says, why are you driving around this old rattle trap? Let's go look at some new cars. And I said, uh-uh, the minute you show me some new cars, I'm going to want one. <laughs> And you know what? She insisted. <laughs> and you want to know what else? I got another car. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I might say a little bit about that other car. Now, the one I had was, it wasn't doing so hot. It was getting 14 or 15 miles to the gallon. And uh, But this new one, a little dinky one, a very little light thing, and it, it was supposed to be fantastic. But they've got all of these anti-pollutant devices in the engine. 
And this one, I want you to know, when it's just sitting in the garage, you just can't it. <laughs> Marjorie, I have to put 100 octane there in those tires. <laughs> but at this time now, I was about the business of not doing anything that would be desired in this This was my spiritual exercise at the moment. And so believe you me, I would never look in clothing store windows because I couldn't afford what I saw anyway. And I would just walk up the street and look in the faces of people and, and look at children and look at flowers and look at the sky and all things beautiful. But I wasn't going to look at a thing that I thought that I might want. But for one reason or another, I, in a spirit of awful anguish, went over and I looked into a men's clothing store window. And down on the floor was a display of wallets, buxton wallets, and they were all stuffed out, and, and they were all very flat, just flat. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that at least one, there, there were several wallets on this earth as flat as mine. <laughs> and it struck me funny. <laughs> the first time I laughed, and I laughed out loud, and all of a sudden, immediately again, was that feeling of relief and relief. Now, that doesn't mean that I had any dollars, tangible dollars, to pay the tangible bills. It didn't mean that anything had changed in my experience. Nothing had changed. But there was that sense of peace. Peace. Relief. Relief from the agony, and it dawned on me that this was it. This was the purpose of spiritual study. Peace. And I remembered that, uh, that this Galilean prophet 2,000 years ago had said, All ye who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me. And he didn't say, I'll give you a healing, I'll give you a dollar. I'll give you a big bright light. I'll give you, uh, enter you into another plane of consciousness. He said, I'll give you peace. My peace give I unto you. And it's not a peace that the world understands, he said. It's not a peace that can be understood intellectually. Nobody can understand anything I'm saying right here, right now with an intellect. But the heart can hear what I'm saying. The heart. The heart you are. The child heart you are can understand. I felt peace as I stood there. And I remember that in a great loud street voice as though I were talking to someone with me, I said, Thank you, Father. And I didn't care who heard me for the first time. I said, After all, who am I talking to and who's around but myself? Who can hear but myself? And I'm not going to criticize and condemn myself. And I said, thank you, Father. And the joy was with me and it stayed with me. Longer this time, longer, longer. So now listen, all you folks. Every day, every day of your life, something comes along. It's beautiful. Every day you can see something. Every morning you are effortlessly away, and life is present, for which you didn't have to struggle, nor fight, nor strive, nor strength. And every day you can see a flower, or a child, or a the face, or, the, or hear the voice of a loved one. And every day you can see a blade of grass, or a leaf, or a cricket, or a bird. Every day you can see something somewhere along the line that will allow you to let go anguish. That in the simple contemplation of it, the simple acceptance of it, will allow you to let this belief and dream of, of a world of trials and tribulations 
to drain away just for a minute. I would ask that all of you, just for maybe the first time in your life, look on that as the thing called illumination and say thank you. This is it. This is it. And accept the little one first. Accept the little one first. Accept the slight, almost infinitesimal sense of relief that might be just as fleeting as, as the... As the flutter of a butterfly into your scene and out of your scene. It might be just that brief. But accept that for just a minute and say thank you. And say it out loud. And then linger with the memory of it for as long as you can. Stay with it for as long as you can. The, the bills can wait for a minute. Fixing breakfast or dinner or washing the dishes can wait for just a minute or two. Whatever is transpiring in the office, the world isn't going to stop turning if you stop for a minute and accept it. This is a form of meditation in its true sense, to see the beauty that was there, that is there. Stay with it for a minute. Don't rush away. Don't dive back headlong again into the old morass. And watch what happens. The next thing that happens will be a bigger and a, and a more beautiful and a longer lasting. And then another and another and another. And you will find that, to, that you'll have discovered a means to, to let go anguish, frustration, and agony. It works. Tangibly, literally works. In a practical arena of people, places, and things. In this arena, right here, right now, that we call the world scene. It's full of beauty. It's full of love. It is nothing but beauty, and it's nothing but love. Do you know that you're in heaven right now? Isn't that a dumb statement to make? I mean, the intellect, the intellect, boy, what the intellect can do to a statement like this, but this is heaven you're in, right here, right now. And this is not a unique statement by one called Bill. Go back and see what the so-called luminaries of history have had to say, and everyone will say that heaven is even now spread over the whole face of the land. But man, meaning the ones who believe that they are the grand custodian of this awareness that's aware right here, right now, that belief that we are an ego that is that must take care of awareness that's aware right here right now. But men perceive it not. You're standing knee deep in knee deep in heaven right now. You're looking at it. Who says that it isn't a room sometimes with people in it? And who says it isn't a freeway sometimes with automobiles on it? And who says who says that it isn't that, to use an old expression, who says there is no dust on the balustrades of heaven? Who says that it doesn't include arguments with people back and forth? If, when we understand what those arguments are, they're not bad. When we understand what the discussions are, it's not bad. When we understand what the appearance of ignorance or lack, what those appearances are, they're not bad. He says that heaven doesn't have what appears to be dualism in it. Where did the idea come from that dualism has to be done away with? Doesn't have to be done away with. Let's just take that. Let's just follow that for a minute. It comes to run with that. One time Jesus was asked, tell us about the kingdom of heaven. And so what does he do? He speaks of heaven as being a, a field of gleaming wheat. Now he's talking about heaven, bear in mind. The heaven that all of our theologians and philosophers and everything would tell us is just pure perfection, where there's 
Never any anguish, never any frustration, never any, never any appearance of life or anything, never any appearance of evil, sin, sickness, or death. Appearance of those things. But it's just got to be. It's just got to be what a human has dreamt it up to be. It's just got to be that, you see. But here is Jesus, the Master, without question, saying, "It's a field of gleaming wheat in which robbers have come." Robbers? What are robbers? <laughs> How come the ministers aren't talking about robbers, you know, in heaven? But anyway, these, they've come and they've sown tares. Tares in the field of wheat. Tares. Now, have you ever gone through a briar patch? I saw a little boy come running out of a briar patch one. <laughs> I've been in briar patches, all of you have. But someone has thrown, put briars in, in wheat, in the field of wheat. You know, now how would you know what wheat really was if you didn't know what wheat is not and could never be? So what, do, what purpose do the briars serve in the field of wheat? The briars help delineate what wheat is. So we know what wheat is without question, without doubt, beyond intellectualism beyond intellectuality, so that we know infinitely what we do. Wouldn't heaven be infinite knowing? Not limited knowing. Okay, now, the predilection, everybody said, well, now, let's pull up the, let's pull up the tears and get rid of the tears. Let's heal them. Let's overcome them. Let's transcend them. Let's kill them or something else. And what was the reply? No, leave them alone. Leave them alone because in the day of the harvest, that is when understanding is present on the scene, when knowing, which is what awareness is, you said, what is awareness? It's knowing. When knowing is present, then we can separate the wheat from the tares, and one will, will keep, and the rest will be burned away, like the agony that drains out of the fingertips and is gone, like the shadow that disappears, like the dream from which we awaken, it's gone. Okay, so Jesus then speaks of a heaven that appears to have trials, tribulations in it. All I'm saying is that right here, right now, you're in heaven. Uh, we'll get underway now, and I'm going to, I'm going to change directions. I'm going to change pace to 180 degrees. I'm going to talk about this thing of supply. I just like to talk about supply. 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 I, it just comes to me to talk about supply because really now when you stop and think about it, every, every problem that we have in the tangible arena is a matter of lack. It's a supply thing. For example, we feel that we don't have enough companionship. This is a matter of, of lack, isn't it? Or we feel that we don't have enough health, or we don't have enough to do. Or we don't feel that we don't have enough dollars. And uh, since this period, uh, again, this is, I, I cannot do here as I talk like this, as I would in my natural habitat <laughs> when we're wandering around through the woods where we can look at trees and I can make practical analogies and, and very point out very real things. It's, this is sort of a, this is very new to me. This is diff different and, and I guess difficult, I would have to say. Uh, and so, in, but insofar as I can, let me, let's just touch down a little bit on this thing of supply for a minute. And uh, it, this, in turn, will tie in with what I want to do later, which is the real thing upon which all metaphysics, the hook on which it hangs, the one thing that it appears never to have resolved to anyone's satisfaction is this matter of dualism. And I want to 
uh, we want to resolve that before this is over with. Explain it so that we can get rid of the problem of dualism. Good and evil, right and wrong, male, female, uh, and so forth, all of that, and understand it for what it is. So now I'm going to start with the thing with supply, just because it'll be a different way to do it. And uh, once again, I remind you that you don't listen with your intellect. I'm not talking to intellect. The intellect doesn't doesn't hear. The intellect is concerned with the science of being. The intellect is most necessary. Most it's most important. It serves its purpose. When we understand what is before our eyes, we can see what the intellect is for and what it does. When we first when 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 we first study. We're usually intellectually oriented, and then all of a sudden the heart breaks open, and we see that, gee, joy and beauty and love and peace are everywhere. And it is a matter of the heart, and it's a matter of simplicity, and it's not a matter of struggle, and then we want to take the intellect and throw it out the window. And so for a very long time we are heart-oriented rather than intellect-oriented, and we, what do we do? We, We just run into the same walls, in the same struggle that we did when we were intellectually oriented. Finally, we strike a happy bound. It's heart-led. Now, just in very simple terms, for myself I found that the intellect seems to be its primary domain is the tangible arena. Now, admittedly, here is the tangible arena, right here, right now. People, places, and things, experience, the tangible arena, the daily affairs. And this is the promise of the intellect. How to walk across the street without getting hit by a bus. How to brew a cup of coffee. How to, how to, to read and write. This is, in essence, what we have reference to when we talk about intellectualism, and, and intellectualism plays its part in the arena of tangibility. But now look, right here, right now, we see people, places, and things, but is that all there is? Suppose I were to use this analogy. Suppose right here, right now, that instead of you seeing people and tables and chairs and rugs and hear sounds, that you are seeing numerals. You are seeing letters or numerals and the signs and symbols of arithmetic. Now, over here is a 17, and here is a 6, and over there is a 1, and, and here is a 999, and you're being illuminated by 312, and, or 112, 110, or whatever you use out here. And uh, so let's say that that's what we were seeing. Now, okay. Is there not behind all of the numerals, isn't there a grand principle of arithmetic that exists, that is unseen, unfelt, and un- that can't be touched or tasted and so forth and so on, but an intangible principle? Nobody is going to deny that the principle of arithmetic is present right here, right now, even though, even though you might not be working out arithmetic problems. But, but the principle of arithmetic is present right here, right now. Now, there, there are some musicians here in this room that will tell you that even though they're not hearing Beethoven's symphony, that the principle of, of music is here, here. It's present, right here, right now. And it's everywhere present. If you were to climb up on the roof, it would be there. If you were to dig a big hole in the ground, it would be there. You could, you can flee to the hittermost parts of the universe. Mm-hmm. So you can make your bed in hell, and behold, I am there, as it's put in the Bible. 